Okay, you stood in the Falcon is on the plane at Hadley. The June 1971 issue of Life magazine featured an eye-popping photo that was sure to delight any fan of American muscle. Astronauts Jim Irwin, Al Warden, and Dave Scott of the upcoming Apollo 15 mission were photographed, arms crossed and tan in the Florida sun, standing in the driver's seats of their three matching red, white, and blue 1971 Chevy Corvettes. Cars provided to them by General Motors for the nominal fee of $1 a year. The trio of Corvettes was a sight to behold, but they were overshadowed by an entirely different and much more exotic breed of American car, positioned in the foreground of the photo. This was the as yet unproven lunar roving vehicle, popularly known as the Moon Buggy. Although the Russians had put the first wheeled vehicle in space, we'll get to that later, the Americans were banking on a much splashier feat actually driving the first car in space. A month after the photo, the three astronauts strapped onto the side of a Saturn V rocket and blasted off on course to the moon. Once there, they successfully landed and deployed the rover to the surface of the moon. Its ingenious design was the result of 17 months of nonstop engineering work done by some of General Motors and NASA's most brilliant minds but nobody knew if it would actually work on the moon. Dave Scott reporting Apollo 15 on the plane at Hadley. Irwin and Scott got in the buggy. Everything looked good, but running through their minds was the same question that goes through every single driver's heads as they get behind the wheel of an untested car. Would it run? We'll get to that. But first we have to answer some of the biggest car questions in the cosmos. How do you get a car into space? How do you power it in extreme temperatures without oxygen to fill the tires or create combustion? How does driving in low gravity work? And how fast can you go? How do you even prepare for something like that? Is there a driver's license for space? From Soviet hot tubs to hopping asteroid rovers, from the moon to Mars, today on Past Gas, we're talking space cars. Or if you prefer, cars in space. Past Gas Podcast. It's not cars, it's not about forts. It's a <laughs> Muppets awesome. reference. Nice, deep. <laughs> Dude, this uh, picture of the the astronauts uh, with their Corvettes is so sick. Yeah. They all have like alternating. Um, so there's like a red Corvette, a white Corvette, and like a deep blue one. But then they all have alternating uh, red, white, and blue stripes on them yeah. as well. And they're like just like almost the same like when Destiny's Child used to wear like the same kind of outfit, but slightly different. That's like a what, good reference. Thank you. I was but, thinking how uh, if we go karaoke, um, say my name, I think would be a top tier, like three dudes singing a trio song. That's cool. Um, yeah. I think about that a lot. <laughs> um, I'm so excited for this episode. I've been watching Cosmos this week. The one with Neil deGrasse oh, nice. Tyson. I just watched Away. Is that any good? Uh, it's okay. I'm not giving it a full endorsement, but... It's fun. It's a, it's a, the new Hillary Swank show about uh, a mission to Mars. Oh, that's cool. I just watched Apollo 11, oh, the cool. like IMAX documentary that was oh shot in God. 70 millimeter. It's so it's, good. I, I don't know why it took me so long to watch it. It was like so captivating. The footage in that movie is so insane. Like, yeah. incredible. it would be insane if like they had to do it, like if they did it with like a GoPro, but then you think like that camera is like this big. Yeah. Like it's as big as yeah. like my wingspan at least. My favorite part was like uh, in the last stage of lift off in mm -hmm. space and they're like monitoring their heartbeats. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And they're like uh, two of them had like 120, like really elevated. They're just like went through one of the scariest things to go through as an astronaut and then they go to buzz aldrin and he's like 60 or something <laughs> yeah <laughs> unreal like, like psychopath level <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well no man i think there's like when you're in that sort of situation and you've been training for it and i bet they made him go through like mental preparation exercises and stuff like that oh, but yeah. in that moment like he must have been so focused that it transcended like the danger of what was happening yeah i, I don't know like you're just calm. Like, that's what they had been training for for so long. That it's just like, I don't even care about the danger. I'm here to experience this. I'm fully focused. And I've got the resting heart rate of Lance Armstrong, you know? Yeah, this is my job. I'm on the clock right now. Anyway, I haven't even introduced the show yet. This is Past Gas. Hello. Welcome. Uh, I'm your host, Nolan Sykes, joined as always by my other hosts, James Pumphrey. To Cal. 
<laughs> and Joe Weber. I, I'm thinking about switching Wink Wink Nation to Wink Wink Army. What do you guys think? Whoa. Of that? Wink Wink Army sounds more aggressive than Wink Wink Nation. Yeah, I, I think I like Wink Wink Nation. It seems like uh, more of like a utopian vibe versus like a militia. <laughs> a wink wink army couldn't hold me back. Wink wink nation army can't hold me back. <laughs> And I'm teeny bitty, and I'm farted up. So anyway, uh, yeah, I'm excited to talk about space cars because space is great. You know, <laughs> I'm excited. Dude, about you this ever one. think about that, dude? Like, <laughs> stars are just a, just a, a big mass of gas, gases, and materials that gravity brings together, and then you know they they just start like. Um, Today on Podcast, we're talking stars and cars. Ah, <laughs> oh, nice. We're all stardust. In the words of James Pumphrey, we're all stardust. Damn. Anyway, before mankind got so much as a Sputnik into space, we were already dreaming of what cars would look like on the moon and other planets. In the 1950s, Collier's Magazine profiled German-born American rocket scientist Werner von Braun, full name... Mm -hmm. Werner Magnus Maximilian Freier von Braun uh, and his Astro Utopian master plans for America to explore and colonize the galaxy. The articles were pure 1950s style hype with scenes featuring the swaggering title Man Will Conquer Space Soon. 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 One of the articles imagined moon exploration that made use of three surface vehicles, quote, Tank-like cars equipped with caterpillar treads for mobility over the moon's rough surface. Power is provided by an enclosed turbine driven by a combustion of hydrogen peroxide and fuel oil. The vehicle goes 25 miles an hour on flat ground. <laughs> Since gravity on the moon was only one-eighth of that on Earth, Von Braun poetically pictured the space cars would be followed by a, quote, spray of dust which settles almost immediately like a bow wave on a motorboat hmm. that's pretty that's a cool image that's a cool yeah. visual to imagine the tractors each weighing 10 tons would drag three trailers a piece full of gear and personnel what? in preparation for a six-week exploration involving 50 crew members crazy i love this sort of like blue sky kind of speculation uh-huh yeah that's why popular science was one of my favorite magazines as a kid because they always had like crazy tech on the cover and like all this speculation as to what it would be able to do and mm -hmm. i don't think much of that has come to fruition no maybe maybe in like less impressive but equally important ways um, i mean it's just like there was a shift in what we focused on and now much of the focus of technology is just collecting our data so we can that's a fair point <laughs> be sold things it's like we're not focused on like space cars or you know like travel or like we don't have like a passenger jet that breaks the speed of sound anymore but uh they know what ads to give me and they know how yeah. much, how often i leave my house yeah i keep getting served ads for crocs because uh, i've been looking at them ah. it's like, I, I would i i love them i love mine I, yeah, that's I know the only do. ad serve that I really agree with because I, I was a holdout for a long time and I was like, Crocs are dumb. And then once I finally gave in to Crocs, it was one of the best days. So yeah, there's the, the, the six-week exploration involving 50 crew members. That's a lot of dudes. Um, Dude, I would love, like, like I've, you know, I've imagined going to space before and like you're like, like it's always three people, you know? That's what mm -hmm. it feels like. Um. It would be sick to be up in space with 50 people. That'd be a more, yeah, be more fun. I think there's a lot of that, like, there's like a, a segment of sci-fi where it's like, there's only four people in the spacecraft and one of them is a killer. Yeah. But like, I feel like that scenario would be a lot harder to posit when there's 50 people, you know? That's the, isn't that the premise of Jason X where he goes to space? I, it sounds like something they would do. Yeah. <laughs> they but they don't know like they're like ah, you know what i think it's the guy with the <laughs> hockey mask <laughs> i think it's the eight foot tall dude <laughs> hockey mask. and the machete 
Yeah. We can't be too sure. I don't want to jump to any conclusions. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, an article in the series entitled, Can We Get to Mars? Imagine a similar scenario with tank-like space tractors that would drive the living quarters on the surface of Mars this time, traveling from a pole of the planet all the way to the equator. That sounds pretty fun. In the early 20th century, space exploration often figured as an updated form of the Manifest Destiny Doctrine, which held that American expansion was a justified and inevitable mandate from God himself or herself. Just like the oceans in the American West have been explored and conquered, scientists, politicians, and the public now hyped space as the final frontier. Central to this frontier myth was, as we all learned from the Oregon Trail, was transportation. Dysentery. Dysentery. You have died from the mumps. <laughs> Especially in America, <laughs> the horse, the covered wagon, and eventually the car were potent symbols of freedom and exploration, and space was no different. Obviously, a lot of the focus was on rockets and space stations, but equally present in the imagination of wannabe space explorers were the surface vehicles, essentially space cars, but more commonly known as rovers. The word rover means wanderer, and it caught on as a term for space-based space vehicles in the 1960s as an all-encompassing term that could cover both manned vehicles and unmanned remote control cars. Can you imagine a covered wagon on the moon? <laughs> yeah. The horses have their own space suits on? <laughs> yeah, like, but they're like real bulbous ones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love I love seeing old drawings of what they thought cars were gonna look like in the year like 1990, <laughs> and they're just like Cadillacs with huge fins, but like bubbles instead of windshields, <laughs> and like a rotary phone in the middle. <laughs> yeah. For rovers to become a reality, you needed solid ground for them to rove. The moon, a short 238,900 miles away from Earth was the most obvious target. The prospect of a moon landing started to become real in 1959 when the Soviet Union sent a spacecraft named Luna 1 to within 3,700 miles of the moon's surface. Later that year, the Soviet's Luna 2 achieved what's diplomatically referred to as a hard landing, meaning the spherical probe crashed into the moon at full speed and became the first human-made object to contact a celestial body. So they just basically wow. hu hucked a thing. <laughs> and they're like, I bet I could hit that freaking rock. Hey, let's put some dogs in here and crash into the moon. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty impressive, though. When was that? Yeah. Yeah, 1959, they were able to hit the moon, an object nearly 250,000 miles away yeah. that orbits us, you know? Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. The Americans matched the feat in 1962 with the Ranger 4, which was actually supposed to have a soft landing but failed on approach to the moon, an embarrassment to NASA at the time. Oops. Just like they had done when Sputnik became the first satellite to orbit Earth, the Soviets stayed one step ahead of the Americans in the early days of the space race. In April 1966, their Luna 10 spacecraft became the first to actually enter orbit around the moon. The Americans were close behind, with the very literally named Lunar Orbiter 1, achieving what its name said it would do on August 14, 1966. Then, on July 20th, 1969, NICE, the Americans became the tortoise that overcame the Russian hare. Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, and despite all previous setbacks for the Americans, the space race was won. Nice. Armstrong took his one small step for man. Still to come was one small drive for car. One, one thing I learned from that Apollo 11 documentary is that like the history that we've been taught about the space race and that we won like we won one of like seven things and the russians won like every other one like mm -hmm. they were the yeah. first in space they were the first man vehicle in space they they did all these things like before we even got to the moon albeit like that's a great accomplishment and it was insane that we actually did that in 1969 but definitely the russians like had a leg up on us there's a the Discovery Channel put out a great um like short documentary series. Uh, what's it is it called From Earth or something like that? Um, it, but it talks all about the American space program leading up to the Earth uh, the moon landing, um, yeah. and like you know space Skylab and all those different missions like the Alan Shepard mission. I mean, it's just like these images become so iconic that you forget 
that they happened in the 1960s if that makes sense uh it's so impressive you know you think about how how (laughs) even though we love cars from that era like all the muscle cars Mm -hmm. they were like so bad compared to cars (laughs) now yeah so if you just take that same technology that they were working with to (laughs) essentially design those cars but to go to the moon (laughs) Like it's that insane. same computing power. It's unreal to think about. It's, it's a huge achievement. I think it, it, there's like less computing power in the in the spacecraft that went to the moon than there is in like a phone nowadays. Oh, yeah. yeah. Way less. I've yeah. been in the room. I, I went to the control room at NASA in Houston. Uh, that, and you spilled orange juice all <laughs> over the board. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And like the Saturn V rocket is huge. It's so big. It's like breathtakingly big. And then you and just it's, sit on top fucking, of that thing. Yeah, just you're just strapped to the side of it, going eighteen thousand miles per hour. <laughs> That's crazy. That is unreal, man. With a bunch of dudes in a in a room doing math with pencils. <laughs> yeah, and it, it's like the size of like a porta potty. Mm-hmm. Weirdly enough, though, unbeknownst to any Americans, rovers had a chance to beat Neil Armstrong to the moon just a few months before Apollo Eleven. In top secret and unknown to the rest of the world for years to come, the Soviet Union had already tried to launch the first uncrewed lunar vehicle on February 19th, 1969. Nice. In preparation, the Soviets had actually built a lunodrome or moondrome to replicate the lunar surface, which included 54 simulated craters and 160 variously sized rocks all painted gray and black. The vehicle was known as the Lunokhod. Russian for Moonwalker. Hell yeah. Uh, so yeah, they built the uh, Moonwalker, beating Michael Jackson to the punch by 14 years. Unfortunately for the Soviets, upon launch, the rocket containing Lunokhode disintegrated, spreading radioactive polonium-210 all over Russia. <laughs> oh, God. Um, God. Not going to say that line. Uh, had the mission been successful, <laughs> no, say it, please say it. Okay, no. Uh, <laughs> in the words of Michael Jackson, no. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> had the mission been successful, Russia would have proudly shared the news with the world. Instead, there was a cover up. No, not from them. Still, the Russians would successfully collect their consolation prize in the space race. A follow-up attempt, deceptively named, considering it wasn't the first Lunacode, <laughs> Lunacode One was launched in November of 1970 and successfully landed on the moon, making history as the first wheeled vehicle to operate in space. Good job, Russians. Lunokhod 1 soft landed on the moon seven days after leaving Earth. After safely reaching the lunar surface, the lander lowered twin tire ramps from which the rover descended. And then it dumped a bunch of polonium all over the moon. (laughs) At that point, the Russians could breathe a sigh of relief and announce Lunacode's existence to the world. It was truly an impressive feat. Lunacode 1 was was solar-powered and battery-driven, piloted through radio commands from Earth. It would drive around during the two-week-long lunar day and hibernate during the equally long night when a radioisotopic heater prevented it from freezing. It was 5 feet 7 inches long and 4 feet 5 inches high, weighing 1,850 pounds on Earth, which translated to 305 lunar pounds. That's a little (laughs) vehicle. It's a little, yeah, a little chonky boy. Um, (laughs) Eight metal wheels with wire spokes supported the circular body that sort of resembled a hot tub. The hot tub had a lid that would open and close, and when opened, it functioned as a solar panel, and when it closed, it protected the contents of the rover as temperatures on the moon went as low as negative 270 degrees Fahrenheit. Over the course of about nine months, the Soviet hot tub moon machine traveled 6.55 miles and sent 20,000 images back to Earth. But the massive event that was the Apollo 11 mission, to this day arguably the most widely covered news story of all time, viewed live by more than 700 million people, means that the story of the first unmanned rover remains essentially unknown except amongst the most hardcore space fans. Yeah, so like if Donut is uh, the Luno called, uh, Mr. Beast is the the manned moon landing. Yeah, we were the first to give away a house to our friends. <laughs> no one watched it. <laughs> Although it notably blipped back up in 2010 when astronomers at UC San Diego, ha, oh, dude, 
successfully use lasers to locate the rover's position on the surface of the moon for the first time since it died in 1971. Lunacode 1 was followed up by the Lunacode 2, which landed on the Limonier crater. It had six wheels instead of eight, a design choice allowing for greater maneuverability that has continued with modern rovers, including the 2020 Mars rover. Like its pre predecessor, uh, Lunacode 2 featured the now-proven hot tub design. It traveled a remarkable 24 miles through rough lunar terrain, a record for distance driven in space that stood for 40 years until oh. 2014 when the Mars Opportunity rover finally out-traveled it. Until Mickey Thompson built Challenger 4 and drove it on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> Dang, 24. I mean, that's... Yeah, that's long. As the Soviet Union crumbled in the early 90s, the Lunacode 2 also earned its own bizarre footnote. The Russian government actually auctioned off ownership of the Lunacode 2, which I'll <laughs> remind you was still on the surface of the moon in 1993 at the Sotheby's auction held in New York. Richard Garriott, the computer gaming entrepreneur who created Ultima Online, won the rover with a bid of just $68,500. That's a deal. I think yeah, probably cost bragged. millions of dollars to make. Yeah. Oh, for sure. He bragged that he was the the world's only private owner of an object on a foreign celestial body, which is pretty awesome. Dude, actually. they should have put that on Bring a Trailer. They would have gotten at least 100000 <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, in 1971, the United States would finally get involved in the space car race. And although the Soviets had technically won the space car race, the Americans' entry into the space car race would have a much wider cultural impact. Again, Dr. Werner von Braun, now NASA's chief rocket scientist, had supplied the early inspiration for an American lunar rover. This time, in a 1964 article in Nolan Popular Science, hey. titled, How Will Travel on the Moon? He speculated, for short distance travel, a non-pressurized moon jeep may suffice. <laughs> <laughs> the astronauts would hop into its open platform and would depend for protection upon their pressurized spacesuits while life support and communications would be provided by their backpacks. Larger surface journeys will require a pressurized vehicle that offers air-conditioned comfort in a shirt-sleeve environment and room for the explorers to stretch out during rest periods. <laughs> they uh, built one of these. It's basically like a space RV. Yeah. This is I, like what I think of when I think of lunar rovers. Yeah. Space Jeep. Space Jeep. The drawing they have of it in that popular science article is pretty funny. Does it look like a Cadillac? No, it looks like a cabin with wheels. Whoa. Notably, since the 50s, Von Braun had also soured on caterpillar treads. Main issue was weight. Treads were heavy and moonbound rockets had a severely limited payload. Every pound used for a rover meant a pound less equipment for experiments and tests. For tires, Von Braun wrote that wheels could potentially have elastic spokes, which would combine the advantages of a smooth ride with an enlarged traction area. These large diameter wheels would look strange by what Von Braun referred to as Detroit standards, but would stop the cars from getting bogged down in the soft lunar soil. As far as engines, the moon has no atmosphere, so conventional combustion engines are out. Von Braun was skeptical of solar-powered batteries, writing that they need about 25 square yards of area to produce one puny horsepower, so rather large energy-collecting sail would be required. As far as nuclear power, it would entail nasty radiation problems and does not look attractive at this time. Von Braun's proposed solution was hydrogen-oxygen fuel cells. Von Braun also highlighted additional issues, including temperature fluctuation, for which he proposed ceramic insulation as a potential solution. Another worry was lubricant. <laughs> a liquid... Okay, grow up. A, li <laughs> a liquid lubricant like oil would evaporate instantly in the hard vacuum of space. A dry lubricant like graphite wouldn't be effective in space either. They work by creating a gap that gets filled with air. Hmm. To help with these engineering questions, Von Braun enlisted the aid of Detroit. NASA solicited designs from a wide variety of automotive and engineering companies, and auto engineers like Sam Romano of General Motors became involved in the effort. Romano went so far as to personally swear an oath that if a car was going to drive on the moon, he would make sure that it was built by General Motors. 
Can you imagine if like Ford was the one to design the lunar rover and then like GM like seven years later is like, oh, <laughs> the market, we got to make a lunar rover. The various companies got to work and a variety of prototypes were hastily mocked up. The biggest uncertainty was the surface of the moon. For this reason, many designs featured giant five to 10 foot wheels, more closely resembling farm equipment than a car. Some engineers even anticipated that the surface would act like quicksand and proposed oh. an Archimedean screw, which could burrow like a tunnel digger through a surface too soft to drive on. Yeah, there's Whoa. this Russian, um, there's like this Russian vehicle designed to like go through swamps and all that that uses the same kind of method. It's got like two, two screws on the bottom mm -hmm. that yeah. like rotate in the same direction and goes whoop. It's pretty cool. Cool. That makes sense for the moon. By the mid-60s, many of these weirder concepts were dropped. As scientists gained a better understanding of the moon's surface, determined that it consisted of a fine layer of dust over a base of hard rock. Uh, hard rock, base yeah! Of hard rock, yeah. dude. You're listening to Lunar Radio. We've got a collection of fine dust over a base of hard rock. Up next, <laughs> Stone Temple Pilots. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Dude, no, I need to get back into comedy. <laughs> A leading design was General Motors Mobile Lunar Laboratory, or MOLAB, which weighed 8,000 pounds and featured a pressurized cabin. The MOLAB was more along the lines of a shirt sleeve concept Von Braun had written about in Nolan Popular Science. There it is. <laughs> to test whether such an idea could work. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> to test uh, whether such an idea could work, NASA locked two astronauts into a simulated version on Earth for 18 days. The test... Oh, no. Yeah, dude, that would suck. <laughs> Imagine not being able to go outside for 18 days. Wow. <laughs> the te uh, this test was successful, although the astronauts reported that by the end of the test, they were not friendly with each other. After having to share what was basically a barren windowless studio apartment in what was basically an Alfonso Cuaron style version of The Odd Couple. The biggest barrier to such a concept was not astronauts needing personal space, however, it was weight. With such a heavy vehicle, NASA would have to launch two rockets to complete one mission. The first to carry the MOLAB to the moon and the second to ferry the astronauts who would operate it. Hmm. Two rockets would be a huge expense, twice as expensive, in fact. Too much for NASA to bear. <laughs> the MOLAB program was canceled, and it seemed at that point astronauts would be limited to non-vehicular exploration of the moon. However, despite the setback, General Motors decided to continue to provide funding. Eventually, development and testing turned back to a lightweight rover concept, the Lunar Jeep idea that Von Braun had also mentioned. There's also now a new constraint on any new designs. NASA decided that any vehicle would have to fit in a chamber on the side of the lunar module that measured five feet tall, five feet wide, and five feet deep. Not much bigger than the back of a minivan. Ferenc Pavlix, who worked for General Motors Defense Research Laboratories, took on the new guidelines and got to work. First, he built a miniature scale model and drove it in his backyard to test the concept. He used his son's G.I. Joe toy as a model for the astronaut. This guy is fun. His design was sufficiently lightweight, but it was still too large to fit in the space provided as a solution. He made everything on his rover foldable. The seat cool. folded down and the chassis was hinged so that both the front and rear axles could fold up and back 180 degrees to sit on top of the rover, bringing the wheels together. The tires could then fold in on themselves, allowing the rover to be stowed nearly flat. To show off his design, Frank traveled to NASA and snuck outside Werner Von Braun's office, using his remote control to drive the model into Von Braun's office and surprise him. <laughs> ah, ah, ah. <laughs> what a cute little spaceman you are! The presentation worked. Von Braun was delighted by the origami rover and embraced Pavlik's design. NASA, however, was not going to simply settle on the General Motors concept, despite Von Braun's enthusiasm. Grumman Aerospace, the builders of the lunar module, had their own design, featuring conical slatted wheels that prevented dirt and stones from entering the hub. Wait, is that Grumman like the post office? Oh, yeah. Truck? Maybe. Whoa, this thing's cool. Other than the wheels, the design was bare bones, little more than a seat atop a frame. Grumman also developed a similar six-wheeled concept that was remotely piloted. The thinking was that a rover that had to be piloted by man was of a limited use, while a rover that could be controlled by Houston could continue to roam long after the astronauts had returned to Earth. Good point. However, 
The concept of an astronaut actually driving the rover was too powerful for NASA to pass up, and the Soviets had already beat them to the first unmanned rover with the Lunkenhod. Another prototype was created by the American engineering company Bendix, who also explored a three-wheeled concept. To promote their bid, the Bendix exec in charge even presented NASA head James Webb with a Lunar Vehicles Driver's License, number That's 001. My dad's name. Is it? James Weber? James Weber. Mm. I'm named after your dad. With an X indicating that Webb was a transient, not a resident on the moon. This is this is a cute. Despite this heavy promo, <laughs> Bendix was not chosen. What? Even though it was so cute. <laughs> what a I hate that. I'm glad they lost. <laughs> that is so dumb. Beluga! Did you hear that? That's your moose asking for manscaped. Do you have a moose near the caboose that needs to be tamed? I'm talking hairy, big, and needs some support. Thankfully, our sponsor for today, Manscaped, has you covered to keep that hair looking nice and trimmed and feeling supported. You know what I'm talking about, guys. Manscaped offers precision engineered tools for your family jewels. If you've been a long time listener of the show, you know that Manscaped, they're the real deal, okay? I've experimented with, uh, let's say, male grooming in the past, and no other trimmer has made it as easy to use as Manscaped. The Manscaped engineering team just perfected the greatest ball hair trimmer of all time, the Lawnmower 3.0. It's waterproof, it has an LED light, it's got adjustable shears for different lengths. And it's also made with advanced skin safe technology, which reduces nicks and cuts on your delicate parts. This is the kind of stuff you want when you have a piece of machinery near your delicate parts. Fellas, you can get this trimmer inside their Perfect Package 3.0, which also includes the Manscaped Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and Crop Reviver Ball Toning Spray, both super practical, and they smell great too. You gotta keep it smelling good down there. Plus, for a limited time, guys, when you order the Perfect Package Kit, you get two free gifts, the Shed Travel Bag and the Manscaped Anti-Chafing Boxer Briefs. These things are super comfortable. Maybe one of my favorite parts of the collection, they have optimal temperature control with their crop cooling technology while keeping your pride and joy supported. They are very supportive. So the waistband is also super elastic to reduce chafing and rubbing. Pair these boxer briefs with Manscaped's pH balancing liquid products like Crop Preserver and you're ready for anything. You gotta try this stuff out for yourself. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code GAS20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with code GAS20 at manscaped.com. Your balls well, thank you. From the moose to the caboose, always use the right tools for the job. Manscaped! Big ol' thanks to Mint Mobile for sponsoring this episode. Breaking up with your old wireless provider just got a whole lot easier thanks to Mint Mobile. They were the first company to sell premium wireless services online only, and now Mint Mobile is introducing their unlimited plan for just 30 bucks a month. Let that sink in. Unlimited for 30 bucks a month. What do you spend 30 bucks on every month? I don't know. That's like four days worth of gas. How much is your soon to be X wireless provider charging? Probably like 90 bucks, 100 bucks. Mint Mobile is perfect for people who just kind of hate their phone bill and want to cut ties with big wireless providers. Why am I paying big bucks for uh, a big wireless if I don't even get service in my own house? Look, I got Mint Mobile and finally I have service in my house and it's only 30 bucks a month and it's great. And how are they able to do this? You are probably asking. Well, by going online only and eliminating traditional brick and mortar stores, Mint Mobile passes the savings on to you. That's pretty smart. All plans come with unlimited talk and text plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. You can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number. That's great. You don't have to put all new contacts in, say new phone, who dis? And if you're not 100% satisfied, Mint Mobile has you covered with their seven day money back guarantee. So go on and break up with Big Wireless and switch to Mint Mobile's premium unlimited data plan for just 30 bucks a month. 30 bucks, that's like a dollar a day. To get your new unlimited wireless plan for just 30 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, head over to mintmobile.com slash gas. That's mintmobile.com slash G-A-S so they know that we sent you. Cut your unlimited wireless bill to just 30 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash G-A-S. In the end, <clears throat> nope.
In the end. No. Uh, in the end. In the NASA end. NASA with General Motors. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. NASA went with the General Motors folding rover, with GM actually serving as the prime subcontractor under Boeing, a company with vital aerospace expertise. A guy named Frank Pavlix became the, f the lunar rover chief engineer. As Apollo 11 reached the moon, excitement and optimism were high for future voyages and the possibility of including a rover. The rover was approved for the Apollo 15 flight. They had 17 months to prepare. A priority was cutting weight since the rover would be descending to the moon aboard the Lunar Excursion Model, or LEM. Each pound of extra weight translated to about one-tenth of a second of hover time for the LEM, meaning more time for the astronauts aboard to find a safe landing spot. The goal was for the rover to weigh 400 pounds, and the rover went on the NASA version of a diet with engineers searching for any way to cut as little as an ounce from the design because ounces turns to pounds and pounds turns to tenths of seconds. Meanwhile, the earthbound divisions of General Motors were all too happy to cash in on the glamour of the space program. As we mentioned in the intro, Ed Cole, the president of General Motors, offered all spacebound Apollo astronauts a deal they couldn't refuse for the token fee of $1 they could drive any Chevrolet they wanted. They picked Corvettes, which were quickly nicknamed Astrovettes. For the Apollo 12 mission, for example, GM provided three Riverside gold and black Corvette coupes with the 427 inch big block engines. The gold resembled the reflective insulation seen on parts of the NASA spacecraft. That's cute. As we mentioned, for Apollo 15, Dave Scott, Al Warden, and James Irwin went with a patriotically themed red, white, and blue 1971 Corvettes. Hell yeah. Do you think they fought over like who got the the boring white one? I'd it's take a white boring. one. It I mean it has cool colors. Yeah, I, it's got I the stripes saying. on it, bro. I know. Do you think they fought over the colors though? Mm, I think they probably I think there's like a chain of command. Like I'm the commander, I'll pick first. You're James Irwin. I'm Dave Scott. Who what are we choosing? Four hundred Z's. You get uh <laughs> four hundred Z's and there's a yellow one, an orange one, and a white one. I'll take the white one. Okay. I would like yellow. Oh, I want the orange. That's awesome. <laughs> hey, hey, it worked out. See, that's how it happens. Yep. You know what? I'd like to think that astronauts, they understand their mission. They understand that going to space is bigger than the petty quarrels here on Earth. And they probably had a conversation just like we did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what I think. So anyway, it was a brilliant marketing move by GM connecting Chevy's muscle with the futuristic frontier of space. Commander Dave Scott also noted that the cars boast uh, the cars boosted morale. Quote: The Corvettes were stylized to essentially show the flag and set a bit of unit pride, primarily to let the troops know what we were about. At almost any level of the launch complex, one could look down and recognize the crew's cars. Uh, Dave Scott is from San Antonio, Texas, so that is an accurate accent. Thank you. You really you really did your research, James. Can you do the difference between like a South Carolina accent and a Texas accent? Uh, Texas is more like this, and then South Carolina is more like this. By the way, Commander Dave Scott's Corvette, which was white with red and blue pinstripes, was actually lost until 2018 when Danny Reed, a Texas collector, found it by following up on an ad for a car that was advertised as, quote, once being owned by an astronaut. The car had been sitting in an open field for years, Making it an out of this world barn find. Out of this world <laughs> barn find. Nice, nice, nice. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of barn finds, if you haven't listened to our barn find episode, go listen to that. While the astronauts enjoyed their vets, the design team of the rover had major engineering challenges to overcome. The hours were grueling. The team worked 16 to 17 hour days, six to seven days a week for almost a year and a half to deliver the rover in time for Apollo 15's 1971 launch. First, the design team tackled the issue of tires. They couldn't use rubber because of the lack of atmosphere and the massive temperature fluctuations on the moon. Their solution was an all metal wheel made with wire mesh that essentially simulated an inflated tire. By creating a cylinder out of the mesh and bringing it around in a circle, a tire was formed. The porous mm -hmm. design meant that although it picked up dirt on the surface, it was self-cleaning as it spun. 
On top of the zinc coated mesh, the team bolted on titanium chevrons that covered 50% of the wheel's surface area, providing extra traction. Each wheel had its own independent electric motor manufactured by Delco with an 80 to 1 ratio harmonic drive gear system sealed into the hub. Each motor was 0.25 horsepower at 10,000 RPM, giving the <laughs> rover a total horsepower of one. Damn. There were also two steering motors that pivoted the wheels. For temperature control, the team allowed itself only 10 pounds of weight. Clearly, a typical heating and cooling system wouldn't work. Instead, the team came up with a brilliant solution. They put the motors in a box and filled the remaining space with paraffin wax. As the motor yeah. components ran, they would transfer heat to the wax, which would melt. And then they'd rub it all over themselves. <laughs> um, when the astronauts were done driving, they opened up the radiator covers and the heat would dissipate from the motor boxes, re-solidifying the wax and making the rover ready to drive again. That's a weird solution. Yeah. The next puzzle to solve was deployment. The first design was like a switchblade knife. Push a button and the whole car kind of sprung out of the lem. Just like the switchblade you bought at a county fair, it didn't really work. When they pulled the cable to deploy it for a group of dignitaries, the rover only deployed halfway. And everyone was so embarrassed that day. <laughs> <laughs> They were like, just like, ugh. And go and sit down at dinner. And it's like, so how is work? It's like, ugh. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. I'm so freaking And embarrassed. they just punch their mashed potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> Those issues were overshadowed by a much bigger failure, however. In April of 1970, there was an explosion aboard Apollo 13, threatening the lives of three astronauts who strongly resembled Tom Hanks, <laughs> Bill Paxton, and Kevin Bacon. <laughs> Although, spoiler alert, the astronauts survived, the rover team took the accident as a sobering reminder that moon travel was truly dangerous, and that to justify future missions, they would need to prove there was further scientific value to visiting the moon. This actually played to the rover's benefit, as its proponents argued that the rover could assist astronauts in reaching parts of the moon that would be impossible to reach on foot. The rover was driven using a T-shaped hand controller that simultaneously operated the four-wheel motors, the steering, and the brakes. A switch on the handle put the vehicle into reverse. There was also a handle for a parking brake. Could you imagine they, like, parked it at, like, they're like, oh, man, they drive, drive out to a crater <laughs> and then, like, park it. And they're like, well, let's, like, stretch our legs or something. Forgot to put on the parking brake and it just starts, like, <laughs> going down. And, it's no! floating. Next time they look at it, it's floating in the air. <laughs> <laughs> uh, much like a Skyline GTR, the rover had front and rear wheel steering, but either of which could be disabled. This way, if one steering system failed, the rover could still be driven. The dual steering allowed the rover to turn on a 10-foot radius. To help the astronauts wow. get used to the car, GM built a training vehicle they called the 1G Trainer. It was designed to operate in Earth's gravity, but simulate the conditions on the moon as closely as possible. To do this, the team attached the 1G to counterweighted cables to simulate the 1 6 gravity of the moon. I thought That's it was 1 8. Yeah, I thought it was 1 8. I also thought it was 1 8. Let's split the difference and say 1 6. <laughs> yeah, sure. That's how math works. <laughs> On July 26, 1971, it was finally time for the rover to make the trip to space. A Saturn V rocket launched Apollo 15 towards the moon. On July 30th, the LEM, with the rover on board, landed on the surface of the moon. The two astronauts, Commander David Scott and pilot James Irwin, left the module and immediately got to work deploying the rover. They unlatched the cover and pulled a lanyard to release the rover. They performed an inspection and discovered that the front wheel steering wasn't operational. To everyone's relief though, the rear wheel steering was working the rover could still function. Yeah, luckily James Irwin was a certified forklift operator. <laughs> <laughs> so he had no problem steering with the rear wheels. <laughs> Scott and Irwin boarded the rover and Scott began to drive. Just like in America, the rover was left-hand drive, baby. The first words aboard a car in space were, okay, out of detente, we're moving. Detente meaning a stopped position for the wheels. Could have yeah, said, dude. okay, we're... We're moving. I don't know. Yeah, like uh, uh, they really dropped the ball with that one. They should have said fired up. Fired yeah, up. Fired up. Let's move. Keep it juiced. Or send it. <laughs> send, send it. Send it. Send it. <laughs> All right. All right. Commander Scott, you have permission to send it. <laughs> and they just does a shaka and they start 
<laughs> a television camera controlled by Houston tracked the rover as it set off on the first ever space drive, manned space drive. They drove over a hill leading to Elbow Crater, <laughs> where they got out and took geological samples and then continued onward, taking more samples along the way. Over three different drives, the Lunar Rover, or LRV-1 as it was referred to during the mission, drove for a total of 17.25 miles over three hours and two minutes of driving time. Seems a little slow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's one horsepower. Yeah. Sorry. The Rover allowed the astronauts to collect 170 pounds of lunar samples from a much wider variety of geological zones. These included the Genesis Rock, a 4.1 billion year old sample. Wow, that astronauts thought was part of the moon's crust, although that was later disproved. There were still limitations to the exploration though. The rover had to stay within what was referred to as the walk back limit, meaning that if the rover failed, the astronauts would still need enough life support to walk back to the LEM. Yeah, you wouldn't want to get stranded. I just realized that one horsepower is basically eight horsepower up there though. Oh yeah. That's fair. The rover was a success. Beyond a scientific mission, part of NASA's goal was always public relations. It was a reflection of the Cold War between the US and the Soviet Union. The only way to win at the space race to be, was to be the first to accomplish something. After a certain milestone had been accomplished, the public quickly lost interest in that task being repeated. So the rover, which became popularly known as the moon buggy, was an ingenious way for NASA to essentially invent a new leg of the space race for them to win. Driving on the surface of the moon had never been done before. It's like Rob Deerdack in his, his world records, where he's like, no one's ever done a kickflip in a car. It's like, <laughs> yeah, I guess it's a yeah. world record, but like. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> First to play hopscotch on the moon. It's like, uh, all right. What about jump rope? Okay. <laughs> I threw the biggest rock on the moon. I'm going to play golf on the moon. <laughs> yeah. Hey, that one was cool. That was cool. <laughs> that was cool. Given its success and now proven reliability, the rover was deployed on Apollo 16 and 17 as well. Apollo 16 was notable for what became known as the Lunar Rover Grand Prix, as Charlie Duke recorded fellow astronaut John Young making some seriously impressive turns as he looped around the lunar surface, just sending it. <laughs> Similar to previous astronauts who had golfed on the moon, as Joe mentioned, there was something incredibly charming and joyous about seeing a human having fun driving around on the moon. I th I think I've seen this video and he's just doing like donuts, which is super sick. <laughs> yeah, he's sending it. He's definitely he's sending, sending it. it on the moon, dude. He's What did you think he wasn't sent. gonna send it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm watching the video right now, and he's not going very fast. <laughs> Dude, it's what are you talking about? It's the Lunar Grand Prix, bro. <laughs> Dude, he is kind of sending it, though. <laughs> he, he do be kind of sending it, though. <laughs> <laughs> On Apollo 17, Gene Cernan accidentally knocked off one of the fenders from the side of the rover, just sending it too hard. <laughs> um with how much dust covered the rover constantly kicked up on the low gravity surface of the moon, the rover couldn't be safely driven without that fender cover. And the solution was ingeniously low tech. The astronauts duct taped some laminated maps together to build a fender and taped it to the, to the rover. That's so sick. Ah, mm -hmm. oh, that's bad. <laughs> the solution worked, which allowed them to run their final drive without further incident. I love that. That's so cool. Cernan also recorded what stands as the unofficial lunar land speed record, topping the rover out at a recorded speed of 11.2 miles per hour, baby. Fastest man on the moon. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh, you know, I, if I was him, I'd be, I'd be, I would milk that for all it's worth. <laughs> In addition to speed, Apollo 17 also recorded the single longest trip on the moon, covering a distance of 12 and a half miles in one excursion. Given the proven reliability of the rover, the astronauts were also allowed to travel further from the lunar module, traveling as far as 4.7 miles from their base. Sadly for automotive and space enthusiasts alike, the 1972 Apollo 17 mission was the last time a car had been driven in space. However, NASA did continue to send unmanned rovers much further afield. On July 4th, 1997, the Mars Pathfinder rover known as Sojourner landed on Mars. <laughs> Sojourner. The Sojourner <laughs> was a 25-pound, wally-looking little guy with, with sole panels 
as well as a non-rechargeable battery that allowed for nighttime operation for a limited window. It traveled 330 feet before losing communication oh, with no. Earth. But before it died, it managed to send back some impressive photos, including the first Mars selfie taken from Sojourner's landing module. That poor guy, that makes me sad. Yeah, is that's this, cool though. Look at that thing. Is this the one that sings happy birthday to itself every year? <laughs> I don't know. There is one of the Mars rovers, like every year on its birthday, s- sings itself happy birthday, and it's the cutest, saddest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> NASA followed up the Sojourner with the Spirit, Opportunity, and Curiosity rovers. Yeah, I think it's one of these that does it. The Opportunity, which landed on January 2004, was particularly successful, remaining operational until 2018 and traveling 28.06 miles, finally taking the distance record from the USSR's 1973 Lunacod 2. The opportunity was much bigger than the Sojourner, weighing in at 408 pounds with a 5.2 foot by 7.5 foot body and a height of 4.9 feet. Like the lunar rover, the opportunity had independently driven wheels, six in total, which were charged by solar lithium ion batteries. The Curiosity rover, which landed in 2012, was notable for its size. The biggest rover yet, weighing one ton, measuring nine one. and a half feet by 8.9 feet. Among its accomplishments, it measured Martian radiation, found an ancient stream bed where one or where water had once flowed, and found potential clues that Mars could have once supported microbial life. Its six 20-inch wheels, yeah, dubs, baby, <laughs> featured uh, wheels functioned with a rocker bogey suspension that allowed all six wheels to retain traction on uneven surfaces. Compared to the lunar rover, Curiosity is slow with a max speed of 300 feet per hour, but it's highly maneuverable with 24 inches of ground clearance Whoa. and the ability to climb dunes as steep as 12.5 degrees. That's pretty cool. Meanwhile, on February 6, 2018, an entirely different kind of space car project was underway. As a SpaceX Falcon Heavy FH-001 rocket launched from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, its payload was a South African-born billionaire's personal automobile, specifically Elon Musk's personal 2008 Tesla Roadster that he used to drive to work. Big old shout out to Valvoline for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. We love Valvoline at Donut. They sent us a pallet full of oil. They got the best oil around, and I'm not ashamed to say that. It's actually the original motor oil. Well, what does that mean, Joe, you ask? Valvoline was the first patented motor oil brand, making it the original motor oil. Since its founding over 150 years ago, Valvoline and its scientists have been innovating, they've been creating, they've been reinventing formulas nonstop. Some of those innovations have included the first high mileage oil, the first racing oil, the first synthetic blend. That's pretty tight. It's a lot of firsts, if I do say so. Valvoline has proven to maximize engine life, now with 40% better wear protection than industry standards. Look, if you think about engine wear, what do you think? You think heat, you think friction, you think deposits, and you think wear. Valvoline has proven to maximize engine life. Every motor oil Valvoline makes has been reformulated to provide better protection for your engine. It provides 10 times better protection against heat than industry standard. It's super good for stop and go driving, which is most of the driving that I do. Live in Los Angeles, a lot of cars. It also has 25% better deposit protection than industry standards as well. Let's talk about their full synthetic high mileage oil. It's proven to maximize engine life after 75,000 miles. When your car starts to uh, fall apart a little bit. It's got 50% better wear protection than industry standard. 10 times better protection against heat. It's got 25% better deposit protection than industry standards. This is a lot of smart guy stuff that I don't really understand. But I trust the scientists at Valvoline to make a good oil. They've been around for 150 years. After all, they're the first high mileage motor oil. And Valvoline is the only motor oil with a dedicated engine lab where they run specialized tests and standardized engine tests right in their own facility. This way the scientists at Valvoline can just keep on innovating. All Valvoline oils exceed industry standards to provide the best engine protection for you and your car and your family. Let's talk about our family, huh? Chris Forsberg, ever heard of him? He's a Valvoline driver, he trusts it. What about Mario Andretti? Ever heard of that guy? He won the 1978 Formula One Championship with Valvoline. Jeff Gordon, I mean, he doesn't do backflips, but he can uh, he can pick an oil. So thank you, Valvoline. We love your oil. In the driver's seat was a mannequin in a SpaceX spacesuit named Starman. A nod to David Bowie's song. 
The sound system was set on loop to Space Odyssey, although in the vacuum of space, there is no sound. In the dashboard was a copy of Douglas Adams' iconic sci-fi book, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Engraved on the circuit board were the words, made on Earth by humans. And I just point out the missed opportunity to sending a forward probe into space, but I digress. Or a Ford Galaxy. Yeah. Or a Geometro. A Mercury <laughs> Meteor. The future of unmanned rovers is bright. In 2013, China made its own entry into the field with a robotic lunar rover named U2. Uh, speaking of which, if you haven't already, uh, Nolan and I's U2s are available <laughs> uh, for sale right now. Another NASA Mars rover known as Perseverance launched in July 30th of this year and will reach Mars by February of 2021 with a mission to continue to search for signs of life on Mars. Also on board is a robotic helicopter. What? Known as the Ingenuity that will deploy from the Perseverance and test the viability of aerial missions on Mars. I did not know this. That's, That's sick. freaking That's sick. Cool. I love it. Meanwhile, the next Chinese project is the Chang E5, I, I'm sorry, uh, I, which will attempt to return lunar samples from the moon for the first time since 1976. If that works, that'd be very cool. In uh, 2018, JAXA, or JAXA, Japan's space agency, successfully landed two rovers named Minerva 1A and 1B to an asteroid known as Ryugu, 194 million miles away from Earth. Wow. The rovers functioned by hopping like a grasshopper along the surface of the asteroid, beaming otherworldly images back from space. So this was the one that died as soon as it landed, and they were like, oh, God, like, we spent so much money and time doing this. And then finally, like, it got a glimmer of sun and was able to charge itself just enough oh. to, like, start working Dude, again. Dude, these pictures are pretty sick. Yeah, they're crazy. It looks like, it looks like that Bruce Willis movie. Man, space is so. This is on. This is a rock, a hundred ninety something million miles away from Earth, and we we have pictures of it. And it's mm -hmm. we were able to calculate how to land on it from a hundred four million miles away as it's going. What like thousands of miles per hour? That's crazy, yeah, I, dude. This is so cool, man. Yeah, Ugh. it's like a really complicated version of just like. I bet I can hit that <laughs> stop sign with a rock. Yeah, NASA is basically dude perfect, but like more <laughs> yeah. well funded. <laughs> that's hilarious. Wow, man. That's, that's just so cool. Meanwhile, the future of manned rovers is unclear. There are currently no plans for such a mission, which would obviously in involve a human crew tra traveling either back to the moon or to the distant surface of Mars. Such an effort would require... Uh, effort that would surpass that of even the original Apollo missions and now seems technologically impossible. But still, it's worth it to remember that space exploration has always begun with a wild dream. As far as Mars seems, it's also hard to believe that humans won't one day accomplish that dream. Whenever they do, we'll do a past gas about <laughs> it, baby. Dude, I say screw the moon. We've already been there. <laughs> I don't, it, yeah, sure. We've done it before. We know how to do it. But to me, I want to see someone go. I want to, I want to see Mars, man. I want to see someone get to Mars. I think that would be, that would, well, that would be to get to Mars. Cool. We have to go back to the moon. Really? We have to set up a little like camp there or something. Yeah. Oh. And then we, right, so then we launch is, from the moon. Okay. I'm okay with going to the moon. If that's what it takes to get to Mars. I'm saying like, I don't want the moon to be the end goal. Like a moon base, I guess would be pretty cool. Yeah, but like I'm talking, like, I want to see another planet, man. I want to see some human footprints on the have ground on seen, that red Martian dust. Have you ever seen the images from Venus? Like a mm -hmm. rover, a uh, rover landed on Venus, a Russian rover, and it only lasted a couple minutes because like it has crazy acidic uh, atmosphere and it like melted everything. But there are pictures from the surface surface of Venus, which are crazy. As, as, astronomers believe that Venus may have life on it or have supported life at one time. Um, that's been in the news lately. And, you know, Venus, because of that, it has like a really bad reputation for being so caustic and, and horrible. But like you look at some of these pictures and it just looks like, I don't know, it's pretty barren, I will say. But man, it looks like Arizona. Venus is, yeah, yeah. Venus is closer than Mars. Um, 
and maybe underappreciated. I think people are waking up to how cool Venus is. I know I certainly am. The planets are cool, man. Yeah. You know? We should go to Venus. We should make- Yeah, let's go to yeah. Venus next. Once quarantine's over, let's go to Venus. Guys, thank you so much for listening. That is our story today. Thank you uh, again for uh, hanging out with us. I hope you learned a little bit about the cool uh, space cars, Mars cars, you know how it goes. And now uh, I'm just stoked on space, man. So thank you. Uh, again, follow my co-hosts. Uh, we got Joe Weber, at Joe G Weber. You got James Pumphrey, at James Pumphrey. You got me, at Nolan J. Sykes. Uh, follow Donut if you don't already. Subscribe to our regular channel, all that good stuff. That's it. Take it easy. Go vote. <laughs> Uh, be kind and uh, we'll see you next time.